Welcome to the Easton Book Festival. I'm Rebecca McDowell and I'm here with Sabrina Jones and Paula Hewitt Amran. And we are going to be uh, presenting uh, a, a program about women in comics uh, and issues related to gender and sexuality, which are very uh, current today. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this amazing author program, including Lafayette College, Book and Puppet Company, Erco Community Federal Credit Union, Fidelity Bank, Kelly Nissan, Lehigh Valley Voice, the PA Bacon Fest and the GEDP, Pre-K for PA, WDIY 88.1, and WGPA Sunny 1100. So thank you for supporting our programming. I'd first like to introduce Sabrina Jones, who is um, uh, who creates comics and graphic novels on social, social justice and radical history. Her books, Race to Incarcerate, a graphic retelling, and Isadora Duncan, a graphic biography, were named great graphic novels by the Young Adult Library Services Association. Her most recent book is Our Lady of Birth Control, a cartoonist encounter with Margaret Sanger. Eager to leave her native Philadelphia, Sabrina went off to study painting at Pratt Institute in the late 70s, blissfully unaware that New York City was in its dark ages. When hippies were displaced by yuppies and Ronald Reagan spearheaded a right-wing backlash, she joined a group of pro-choice activist artists called Carnival Knowledge. She drew her first comics for the political comics magazine World War III Illustrated and has continued to edit and contribute to many issues, including Shameless Feminists and the forthcoming My Body, Our Rights. Sabrina was a founding editor of the women's comics anthology Girl Talk. Sabrina has created graphic biographies of Isadora Duncan, Walt Whitman, FDR, Jane Jacobs, Margaret Sanger, and Peace Pilgrim. She has contributed to Wobblies, Radical Jesus, Stud Turkle's Working, Yiddish Kite, Bohemians, The Real Cost of Prisons, and The Best American Comics of 2011. Sabrina paints scenery for film, theater, and television as a member of, of United Scenic Artists Local 829. She lives in Brooklyn. And so Sabrina, welcome. And we're really looking forward to seeing your program. I just wanted to hold up. This is a copy of Shameless Feminists. And this is a book that all three of us worked on together, actually. So we're very proud of it and um, really, really looking forward to the next uh, book, which uh, Sabrina will tell us more about. Thanks. More about those shameless feminists, too, uh, as we get on into my little slideshows. Um, but uh, thank you, Rebecca, for having me here and Paula for pitching in, too. Um, I'm going to start right in and see if I can do this magic screen share thing and show you the first project that I got involved with as an activist artist. I was still in art school. Um, that's me on the top left where it says excitable art students. When Ronald Reagan was elected and it seemed like all the idealism of the 70s was turning into the cynicism of the 80s. And most specifically, our reproductive rights were under attack from the newly politicized uh, religious right. Um, so I met this group of mostly artists about 10 years older than me who were veterans of the 60s and kept telling us, uh, you guys haven't seen a real demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> we had huge demonstrations when I was your age. So um, anyway, we did all kinds of theatrical things, um, which was not really my forte as a, as a visual artist, but I, I jumped in with an eagerness to be amongst radical people who were doing something creative about attacks on our rights. So Carnival Knowledge actually did games and performances and such about reproductive rights. One of the actions we did, I show here, these are drawings I did about it years later. Um, this was an act of street theater uh, in lower Manhattan by the courthouses to mem commemorate the death of Rosie Jimenez, who was the first woman we know of who died as a result of the Hyde Amendment which took away federal funding for uh, Medicaid patients. So she had gone and had an illegal abortion after Roe v. Wade, after the Hyde Amendment. 
and, and had died from it. We had this big cardboard coffin full of like illegal, uh, you know, implements of, of homemade or illegal abortion and flyers to educate people about that. Um, but at the same time, uh, another person I knew from art school, um, Seth Tabachman approached me about this new comic book that he and some friends had started called World War III Illustrated. And uh, I was invited on the basis of my feminist activism to do something I had never done before, which was draw comics. Um, I was a young enough artist to adapt, I guess. But um, so I tried my hand at it and, uh, and it was a little different culturally from the uh, collaboration I'd had with older, mostly women artists. Um, but I considered this something that I had to learn to deal with because um, this was um, this is where the cool people were <laughs> who were taking action. And, and the beauty about uh, the comics was, you know, I, I didn't consider myself innately a performer. And this was something where I could stay home and draw pictures and then, you know, they go out there in the world, you know. And uh, now we know you have to take them out in the world and perform them, but we didn't know that back then. <laughs> so um, this is the cover of the first issue I contributed to. The cover is by Michael Roman, I don't know where he is now or what he's doing, but he did fabulous stencils all over the Lower East Side back in the 80s. Um, so after being kind of a, an anti-nuclear magazine, World War III started to deal with neighborhood community issues as we graduated from school and became involved in our community, most of us living on the Lower East Side at that time. Um, this is not the first strip I did for World War III, but I feel like it's the first one where I found like a, a melding of my style, of my ideas, of uh, my sort of collage painting style with the, with the narrative of, uh, of the comics. Um, and I feel like this is a, this is a piece that, that still stands up today in a way because it explains to a lot of people that abortion rights are not something you just need when you, oops, you got pregnant. You know, you actually, they empower women to feel secure walking down the street when their sexuality is always used, you know, as a weapon against them. So I use my abortion rights every day just to walk down the street. Seth did a lot of stuff in the magazine about uh, housing issues. We all did. A lot of the magazine World War III was very much related to squatting and homelessness and housing rights. Um, many of the strips that he did were collected in this graphic novel, War on the Neighborhood. He encouraged me to do a story about the community center where I had a studio space that was like key to me being able to stay active as an artist on the Lower East Side for a long time. An old school building that had been salvaged by some community members and uh, was used for all kinds of community groups and, and arts uh, until Giuliani decided to sell it to a luxury housing developer. And it, it sits empty to this day. So the set, the demise of uh, El Boyo. Um, and this is a piece done much later, but I put it in here to represent the work that Paula was doing at the time. She seemed to immediately gravitate towards children, working with them in different ways um, in her arts and in her community activism. So she was somebody that I knew back at that time, although we, we didn't really co-edit uh, an issue of World War III until recently. So over the years, I contributed to various issues um, after um, we stopped doing Girl Talk because our publisher didn't want to lose any more money on us. <laughs> so I, I turned back to um, doing more women's issues of World War III and female complaints was, was the first one of that sort of post Girl Talk era, uh, bringing Girl Talk into World War III. Um, the one above Shameless Feminist here, uh, that was the, really the first women's issue of World War III. It was called Her Stories. And you can see uh, Isabella Bannerman's figure on the cover there. Um, Fly's art is on the left on the back of another issue. And in the foreground, Shameless Feminist 
is really our first collaborative cover. It was Paula's idea that we do a timeline that involved all of women's history, which, and that we draw different parts, which we didn't exactly do that, but, um, but we have background figures by uh, an Indonesian artist named Fitri DK. And then I drew the foreground figure uh, representing uh, us cartoonists and, um, and Sandy Jimenez did the lettering. I also got involved in um, this clinic defense movement at that time. I kind of felt like at times I was, I needed to be politically active to inform the art I was doing about the issues that rather than going off into my own brain's little um, takes on it, it was useful to check in, you know, not only because they needed my body on the street, but it was useful to me to make sure that uh, the issues that I was covering um, you know, I was dealing with them in a way that was realistic and aligned with what the real issues were. Um, so I worked with WAM, Women's Health Action and Mobilization for that time. This was in the, in the early 90s uh, when there was a lot of clinic harassment. Um, and, um, and I did some graphics for them, which you see behind me and in this drawing, um, which were used at that time in actions we did when there was a massive attack. This is Dobbs Ferry. There was like a big sort of national targeting of the clinic there. Another way that we have worked with protest is by doing um, this booklet to be given out at a protest. It was, this booklet was a collaboration of uh, between World War III and The Shadow. And uh, it has this marvelous art by Suko uh, to launch the beginning of the uh, Trump regime. But the person, who's <laughs> the person who was trying to give this out, our wonderful founding editor, Peter Cooper, told us that, that here he was at the Women's Pussy March, you know, uh, trying to hand out free magazines and people are all looking at him strange. And he's one of the most agreeable, approachable, friendly guys you could know. Um, so he gave them to his daughter who you see in the picture. And, uh, and she was easily, all of a sudden, everybody wanted a copy when they could get it from, from young Emily. Uh, I was uh, not in DC, but at uh, the march uh, in New York. And this was a, a blow up of the drawing I had done for that publication, which I made into a poster and, and took out on Fifth Avenue uh, for that uh, inauguration time of these terrible years. So I'm gonna stop slide sharing about my origins now. And we can hear a bit from Paula about how she got involved in art and activism. Or we can hear more about her from our lovely moderator. Great, that was, was so wonderful to see those images, Sabrina, and uh, seeing Charles Elbolio again, you know, just alive and just, uh, it was so it was so good. I actually handed out some of those uh, flyers too, some of those booklets too, when when we were at the um, the protest on the night of the inauguration, and that was quite a night. <laughs> People were getting arrested all over the place. But uh, moving on, um, we're, we're going to introduce Paula Hewitt Amram, and Paula is a queer artist, author, activist, and ally to children and teens working on their own self-identified art and activism. She has been out to her students since 1982 and has worked with kids as an advocate on the laws in New York State respecting sexuality and gender identity and expression of each student in school. She's built 160 green public playgrounds with the leadership of community groups in New York City, Newark, Oakland, LA, Cuba, and Miami, designed for climate change and rising sea levels in participatory teams with kids. Wow. Paula authored participatory design curriculum used by the New York City Education Parks and Sanitation Departments. Using this participatory design guide, Paula works with Brotherhood Sister Saul and BUGS, that's in capitals, BUGS, to design and build organic gardens and greenhouses and support black owned and indigenous led work on reparations and land reclamation. The focus of Paula's artwork is the view from inside each of these efforts with a focus on women and children. Women, children and women are 
historically disenfranchised and powerful. And these contradictions and ambiguities worm their way into Paula's work and activism. Paula? You're mute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca and Sabrina. I live right on the Q train, and so you'll hear it going by. So now you're situated. People in Easton, now you're in Brooklyn on the train. So it's very nice to see everybody who's going to be with us, even though I can't visually see you. I can see that uh, you'll potentially be enraged and inspired and moved by, we hope, the art and the connections that we're describing. I really appreciate um, the way Sabrina brought us into the connections of her personal life, her political life, her art life. Um, and I feel like that's a big part of what I'd like to convey as well is those relationships. The art that you see here takes place in public gardens and public schools. And in order to make for myself and other people the kind of place where art can happen about abortion and sex education can happen, I've gotten involved since I was a teenager in making public schools, public gardens, and public parks more controlled by people so that this type of radical self-education can happen and my own self-education can happen in these places alongside children. So you can see in the banner making process that people are talking to each other and that the words on the banner, safe abortion, saved my life is then a banner that's going to be in this case given to a group in texas who requested it and then used in activism and you saw that connection in sabrina's work as well that the art has its own life as art and then it becomes part of an activist protest and then there's art made about that as well and i think that interweaving together is um, is a theme that you're gonna you're gonna be seeing. In addition to supporting the social openness around these places, I've also been working with the communities to make the physical openness of the place, and in some cases, take places that are contaminated and make them more available as public places that we can all work together in greenhouses in New York City are really necessary because of the cold winters that we do still experience and being able to host groups through the year gives that continuity. Over the last 40 years I've both worked with Charis that you heard Sabrina talking about and in fact I'm sure we met there right we must have because we were working on it at the same time. There were a lot of kids involved and having spaces like that that people can be in through the winter is really essential for a lot of our organizing to happen. You see petroleum contamination being remediated at the bottom of these paintings where buried oil tanks that we have all over our city are making it so these spaces that we're trying to meet in, that we're trying to work in are contaminated to the degree, especially in underserved neighborhoods where this is not being cleaned up, making it so that we can't be in these spaces. So we're working with groups who are remediating them themselves. And in the left, this is Nando with Brotherhood Sister Soul, the group that you heard from in the beginning in Rebecca's bio, where it's a Black-led, Black-owned organization that is freeing the land in Harlem and making it so that the composting, the building of the structures is now in the area of 143rd Street and Hamilton Place. If you go up there, 
there are youth-led markets. They have bought and built four buildings that are used by 400 kids a day for radical political organizing, sex education, trans rights, really beautiful um, environmental and political organizing. And so through my art, I've been working with them and with other groups over the last 30 years to support that type of participatory design and including nature, very young children and helping translate between teenagers and adults who often um, can unintentionally neglect the voice of very young children in the same way that women and children and teenagers are historically disenfranchised. I feel like the youngest children are the most ignored of all of the groups because of developing language, but then also the most vulnerable. And I've always been really interested in how art can be a way that that communication can happen. So in the physical places, the bioremediation that occurs to me is really a symbol for that kind of healing that's constantly happening within me. And that's something that both Sabrina and Rebecca also talk a lot about in their work, that connection between the physical healing of our communities and my personal health and healing. This is a map that shows the development of one of these places and how it's an ongoing process of building and rebuilding and redesigning the place. So this is a park that I began working on in 1990. It's still a public park and now it's being rebuilt and redesigned for the next generation that's using it. And then this goes back to the period of time that you heard Sabrina speaking about in the early 80s when we were dealing with the direct threats at that moment from Reagan, who is characterized here as the octopus. And this will be in our upcoming issue, My Body, Our Rights, that you also heard about from both Rebecca and Sabrina, where over the last 40 years, we see these same attacks repeated. And then that's symbolized by the fact that this octopus, even though it's being cut by the center of the page here and being attacked by the spear is splitting off and continuing to attack. And now it's even worse because June 24th, 2022, we lost Roe. So now I want to bring this back to a question to Sabrina. I'd like to start with what I consider the hardest question uh, when we were first discussing this. How do you, um, how do you feel now, what work of yours is resonating with you, Sabrina, at this moment in time? And I'm gonna stop sharing in order to hear your response. Thanks, Paula. This was great always to see your work and to hear the way you talk about it too and the people that you work with. I can really imagine what it must be like to be in on one of those projects. Thanks, um, I appreciate that. So uh, yeah, I, I thought about this question. <laughs> and in fact, I dealt a little bit with that walking down the street peeps because uh, that I showed you some up before because I felt like it was the first piece after after Carnival Knowledge, after I didn't have older artists telling me what the what the new party line was, you know, and I was coming up with my own line, and it really was from my experience of what makes me feel vulnerable and what makes me be able to um, really um, go wherever I want to go, you know, without fear. Um, so that piece still, I feel like it's is very um, something that uh, young women should be able to relate to. Um, and learn from, but also I feel like there's a piece that I did in uh, Shameless Feminists uh, called My Body, 
that I'll show you some of later that is about my own experience of, of being a, practically you know, a victim of a sexual assault as a young teenager. And that was something that it informed my, um, uh, because I had been attacked by a stranger on the street when I was 13, I just assumed that women walk around on the street and when a guy cat calls them, they think, uh-oh, is he gonna try to grab me? You know, is he gonna follow me until we're on the street where there's nobody around, you know? Um, I mean, apparently not everybody thinks that way, <laughs> but as, a, as coming up as a young woman, that was like, that was always in the back of my mind when I was verbally harassed, you know, on the street is this, I learned that there was something called rape testing where you, um, they see how you respond to provocation. If you seem like you're scared and maybe could be manipulated or, you know, if you're, you know, tough chick and you're not gonna take any shit and you're gonna shake them off, you know? So I considered that, okay, it wasn't just my paranoia. This really is a thing when people speak to you inappropriately on the street, you know, that, that could turn various different ways according to how you react. No. And um, so I think that for years, I didn't think that I, that was a story that I could tell the story of my being assaulted. I used it once to get out of jury duty because they, <laughs> I told them I had been a victim of sexual assault and I felt like I was, I was, you know, exaggerating it because I didn't want to do jury duty. But then I realized I really was, even though he did not manage to proceed to penetration and I did manage to escape. By the time somebody drags you in a building and holds a knife to you and makes you take your clothes off and climbs on top of you, you've been sexually assaulted, even if there's no penetration. <laughs> you, you walk away with the, with the post-traumatic stress, you know, and that colors your identity, your sexual identity you know, in many ways that I explore in that piece now. So I think that there was, uh, I've learned now not to discredit my experience and say like, oh, well, I wasn't really raped, you know, um, when I shared so much of that experience. And I hope that that's a piece that people can learn from in terms of trusting their own instincts and their feelings and their truths. And that leads to a next question, um, definitely connected to your piece, I use my abortion rights every time I walk down the street. That phrase has made its way into my mind in a way that I feel like is very soothing. And I feel like I, I want it out there more, that phrase, it's a beautiful phrase, you know? And I feel like it gives the positive, empowering side of abortion rights and that we do use them every time we walk down the street. It's beautiful. Um, my question to you, and you did talk about it when you were describing, I really loved what you said about how when you went and worked on clinic defense, it was to make your body available to the support the movement. Also though, to make sure that what you're putting into your art was current but one of my questions is going kind of deep, what, um, can you trace for us some of the interest in your work in working on issues of women and sexuality? Like where that evolved from and why that's an important subject to you personally. And I think you've touched on it with what you said about the assault, other parts of, the motivation for that I would love to hear about. Well, as somebody who was a, a child in the 60s and a teenager in the 70s, I, I always heard about all these liberation movements for other people, you know? And I remember the point when I realized that women's lib was actually for me. It wasn't for other people because like, that's what I was growing up to be. <laughs> And um, you're a person. Yeah, I think that the, the first piece of real, you know, 
I, I, I guess that year that I was a senior in art school after the year after Reagan was elected, you know, was when I started consciously doing stuff about women's roles. But in Carnival Knowledge, one of the things I did was that um, uh, my, my friend April Ford had for her contribution to the carnival had wanted to create a feminist fashion show. And so I decided for that, I was going to make a dress of a Minoan snake goddess. Uh, so this was like an ambitious sewing project <laughs> of which I failed because as you may know, the Minoan snake goddess, her dress comes down below her breasts and I chickened out of that and sewed a piece of flesh colored satin there. I think, um, I think I it wasn't legal at the time to bear that your breasts. That would be a good excuse, but <laughs> It's chicken out anyway, but anyway, I that was a piece where I, I, you know, we stood on little platforms in this at this big carnival event with multiple performances and exhibits. I know and, I was there. I saw you there. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I have to have the dress in the closet somewhere. Um, I have the simplicity pattern I adapted where I had redrawn the little, um, you know, prairie girl dress into a how I was going to adapt it into a, a snake goddess. So that was something that, that I always wanted to take the sort of celebratory side of it, you know, of like uplifting this role, you know, through this ancient goddess idea. And it, it also touches on, you know, my, my also my love for time travel too. Um, that I, I feel like in a way, if the most responsible thing an artist can do is uh, present a record of their time. And that I, I failed to do that in many ways because um, I'm a sucker for history and I love to go back down there. And to me, these I find places in history that resonate uh, with our times, but I feel like I have to explain that to people. And, and I take, it, it's way too much fun for me to, to go deep in the research and imagine and try to bring to life these other times and how people like us uh, experienced things. And that relates to another question that I have for you. Um, I can really tell when I'm reading your pieces and looking at your art that you're passionate about the research and you can just feel, you could feel it in the drawings and you can feel it in the stories. Can you talk to us about your research process? Hmm. I think that Maybe choose one example if you want. Hmm. Let's see. I, there was something. I guess uh, when I when I was doing a biography of Isadora Duncan, I kind of related to her as my great grandmother because she was the generation of my great grandmother. You know, she was the pioneering modern dancer who basically invented modern dance as an art form, and was a feminist icon. And uh, my great grandmother was of her generation, but was a much less courageous artist, you know. Um, and instead of insisting on independence, my great grandmother married people who could get her somewhere, but then would get between her and her art. So I saw her as fulfilling um, this uh, this shared this destiny that that was sort of missed in my family because Isadora was, you know, she wasn't going to be second fiddle to any husband, you know. She was the star of her family performing troupe and they became the backups for her. So it, that's, it started with her, um, her uh, autobiography, which is naturally suspect because she wrote it at the end of her life to make money when she couldn't really dance much anymore. And, um, and all anybody wanted to hear about was her love affairs. Um, and then, uh, I read other biographies of her, which called other people's memoirs and her um, letters that managed to um, give a little distance to her version of story, which is fun. There's like tension between the way people present themselves and the way, uh, the way other things that the record shows. But I also felt like I had, I had been to a lot of the places where she had been, you know. You know, I had been to the Acropolis that she, where she dreamed of being like a Grecian goddess come to life. I had been to Paris where she worked and, you know, so it helps to kind of imagine those footsteps, you know. Um, I did not go to Russia. 
So I got an old guidebook. <laughs> she she spent a lot of time uh, trying to open a, a school for the poor in Russia after, in the early communist days, and uh, and I became, you know, I, I became like convinced that I had to go to Russia. That would be wonderful. I'm 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 kind of over that right now, but. Um, when I did the book on Margaret Sanger, also, I mean, she was active mostly in New York, so it was easy to go to places on the Lower East Side, go to the Tenement Museum, where they have rooms decorated in her period, early 20th century, uh, the kind of tenements she visited as a nurse. And um, the neighborhood where she opened her first clinic, her first free birth control clinic, her outlaw clinic, was in Brownsville. And I had never been to Brownsville. I live in Brooklyn. I hadn't been to Brownsville until I was reaching this, researching this. And I first I look it up on the address of her clinic on Google Street View. I saw some of the buildings weren't there anymore, but that was the facade. And I thought, I have to go. I have to go. I was scared. I heard it was a scary neighborhood. I went in the middle of the day. Um, I'm so glad I walked there because then I had thoughts, you know, for the introduction. I had I had different thoughts about what it meant to memorialize her and the beginnings of, of birth control legalization from having been there. So I really recommend people try to go to the places that you can, even if you don't have 10 years and a huge research grant to, to travel for your subjects. Right, you can at least do it locally. Yeah. And I really like the way you're saying that you connected it to your family members timeline. And so you were able to place yourself there and also bring it into your personal life. So you're bringing your personal life into the work. You're bringing the person's life that you're studying into the work and into your life. So you're kind of dragging them all into each other and then can you tell us a little bit about the revisions process that you go through? Because you'll do a first draft, you'll do a script. Can you lead us through the steps that sometimes you take? I know it's different for different projects, but how do you? Yeah, it's weird. It is different. <laughs> it's like when I when I did my first book, I thought I should I had should draw the whole thing in pencil, every chapter. I couldn't script the whole thing, just like an outline. I mean, it's a biography, so you have a sense of what's going to happen. And then uh, I penciled the whole thing before I even spilled a drop of ink because I was afraid my style wouldn't be consistent across it. Now I'm not afraid of that. I, and I can't wait to start inking because I think that's the most fun in the world is when you already have built your pencil armature and now you get to make it look beautiful. And there's a moment of terror there when, you, when you're shifting from pencil to ink because pencil is all full of potential. You imagine it's going to look great. And then you've got to come up with the goods and often your first ink drawings, they look worse. <laughs> so um, I'd like to, I, what I would like to do next time is draw a lot more character studies, you know, because I find that when you're drawing a person throughout the length of a book, in the beginning, you've drawn from photographs. And so you start very detailed and then you, it takes a while to develop a shorthand for them. And I know real cartoonists do that. They draw a bunch of character studies of the character in lots of positions, but I'm, I'm a you know, self-taught cartoonist. So I don't, I don't always do that, no. And that relates to my next question, which is what do you feel like you're working on now? Like, what do you want to improve? And is that something you feel like you're going to set for yourself on your next piece that you're going to try to do some of those character studies? Like what's your goal with your development as a artist now? I feel like I wanna be less pedantic and, and feel like sometimes when I look at other people's stories, I see like, wow, they just skipped over that. Or when they made the movie, they didn't worry about how she grew up and how she got from here to there. Like, like I feel like you have to explain how does like a kid from California whose mother can't pay the rent, you know, doing piano lessons, wind up dancing for rich people's salons in London. You know, there's like a series of steps. I don't know, like the, the Vanessa Redgrave movie just, just had her suddenly appear in, in London, you know. But I feel like that's, that's part of the struggle. And so I wanna tell that because I think becoming 
some great person is often more, you know, a, it's a more fascinating thing than just being that person once you've achieved a certain stature. Um, you know, volume two of multi-volume biographies often get really boring once they get on with their powerful life. But uh, I'll always go for volume one. But I think there's uh, there's there's got to be ways to to let myself have more freedom to attain a wildness in the in the art, in the drawing, in the story conception, while still having clarity um, in the story. I think I'd like to, I'd like to loosen up in my drawing more, you know, because sometimes in the page you've been doing that. Puzzling, puzzling, you know, there's so many things like I have to have more room for this and yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. I hope <laughs> that's working. That, that emerging looseness. And um, can you show us your next series of slides? I think this is a good segue into that. And can you give us um, a sense of time, Rebecca? You're muted. We're, we're doing good. We're a little more than halfway. Beautiful. So yeah, Sabrina, it'd be lovely if you could show us another series of slides. Yeah, I've put together another little group of slides that specifically focused on my radical history comics. So let me open the screen share again. And This was the first page of the strip that I did for Wobbly, so graphic history. A bunch of us artists from World War III were invited um, to contribute different chapters to this book. And it was really my introduction to doing radical history research. Um, our artist, Nicole Schulman, became a co-editor of it. Uh, it was started by Paul Buell, who was a professor of American studies and a veteran of Students for a Democratic Society and a huge comics fan who his vision was to um, make us all, you know, do graphic histories that would be then used in schools and everything. So um, some of that has been achieved, but he was very helpful for me launching me in this new passion of mine for for history here. So this chapter that, uh, that I picked or was picked for me, I guess, Nicole steered me towards the pageant of the Patterson strike was about a convergence of radicalized um, or unionized silk mill workers in Patterson, New Jersey, who gained support from the Bohemian intelligentsia of Greenwich Village. And so these were two groups that suddenly were collaborating to put on this massive show at Madison Square Garden to publicize the strike and, uh, and gain support for it. So I found all these fantastic characters um, and uh, Paul thought you know, that the artists of that period, we were somehow the current version of them. So that was kind of a flattering mirror um, to have held up to us. But basically I felt like I didn't have to go out and make revolution in order to draw about it. Here were these people who did it, you know, a hundred years ago, and um, you know, all I had to do was uh, go to the library and, um, and and hit the drawing board. And so I was happy. I was in a sort of like back to the drawing board mode. That was that was very comfortable for me. One of the sections I illustrated besides the pageant was this little introduction to all the radical movements that were going on at the time, and this page has three women who all eventually had graphic novels about them. Um, Paul Buell told me that Sharon Rudolph had gotten a contract to do a graphic biography of Emma Goldman. And I was like furious. I mean, I was jealous. I said, I, I wanna do a graphic biography spinoff of Wobblies. Um, so uh, he said, what do you wanna do? And I said, Margaret Sanger. And he said, no. So, <laughs> apparently felt that she had taken a, a turn to the right later in life, which is debatable. But anyway, uh, uh, sometime later he came and told me he'd found a publisher that would do a graphic biography of uh, Isadora Duncan by me. So now I look at these are my first drawings of Sanger and Duncan who I've since drawn many, many times and they just look like horrible likenesses to me. They look really, boy, would I like to redraw these, but they're, they're, they suit the purpose. Um, so this is a two-page spread from the Isadora Duncan biography. 
that shows you how much she was adored by uh, her, the dancers who came after her, who would like made up, you know, she, they were her legacy in, in modern dance. And she was also revered as a, just an icon of the liberated woman. Um, and she was also equally detested by uh, right-wing figures at the time, because not only did she dance and live like a wild free woman, but she embraced radical causes. And she, you know, one of her final actions before she died was picketing the US embassy in France to protest the execution of Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, so she was radical to her dying day, which came way too soon, as you may know. Um, the next subject that I, that I really embraced that was kind of most relevant today was Margaret Sanger. And uh, I knew that she was the founder of Planned Parenthood and there was some controversy about her, uh, which we can go into later, but I followed all of the best sources of her own writing and biographers who studied her. And, and I reflected on my own experience at Planned Parenthood because I, I conceive this as having a sort of a minor, uh, you know, parallel story of me coming of age and becoming a, um, a pro-choice artist, um, beginning with Sex It in the, in the 70s, which was largely me thumbing through the copy of Our Bodies Ourselves, which my parents had um, on the shelf. And uh, I don't know whether they put it there on purpose for me to find, but I sure found it. And, uh, and then the next was going to Planned Parenthood when I, you know, when I didn't learn in school sex ed, the most important thing to me, which is like birth control. <laughs> but they really, the clinics at Planned Parenthood, they were, they were classes. We went down there on Saturday, the, all the high school students, and they just, they just put us in small groups with somebody who would teach us all the different methods and what their risks and you know how effective they were. And then we would choose, you know. So it's interesting to me that um, Sanger has been so much attacked by opponents or Planned Parenthood, the opponents of Planned Parenthood and abortion attack Sanger, who actually was opposed to abortion herself. She believed that promoting birth control would, would be the end of abortion. So I'm sorry, I may, I may sneeze. <coughs> but um, as we know, abortion uh, still happens, even though birth control is now legal and pretty accessible and there are much more effective forms of it than there were in her day. But um, as methods are not perfect and neither are people, um, we are still defending our clinics. No. But her first flyers to promote that first clinic said, prevent, don't take life. That was her goal because poor women were using abortion as their regular form of, um, of their frequent, a frequent form of birth control for lack of access to birth control information or because it was very expensive. Sanger used to always tell this one story about how she became an activist really focused on on birth control because she was a nurse and she was involved with the socialist party she was involved with the wobblies and the patterson strike but this experience of tending a patient who she called sadie Sachs, who had almost died of a uh, self-induced abortion and then asked the doctor for information on how not to get pregnant only to have the doctor say tell your husband to sleep on the roof. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So Sanger was left absolutely feeling guilty and desolate and responsible when that same woman a few months later got pregnant, tried to abort and wound up dying again, the mother of young children. And she describes leaving the scene of the father and the children, walking the streets all night, until she finally said, I can't, I can't continue with these palliative cares. I have to seek out the root of evil and change the destinies of women. Um, that's her beleaguered husband, Mr. Bill Sanger in bed there. And how she did it, besides publishing and promoting uh, 
information about uh, birth control and inciting women to be radicalized was ultimately she opened our first birth control clinic at 46th Amboy Street in Brownsville, Brooklyn, where there I am doing a little sketch, contrasting today and, and then. Um, on, but on that day back in October of 1916, she had already papered the neighborhood with flyers in three languages, Italian, English, and Yiddish to represent the population of Brownsville at that time. And she had a huge line form outside before she opened. Um, with, they have photos of them with all these baby carriages. Um, she and her sister, um, who, Ethel Byrne, who was also a nurse, um, provided inf all of this information and they didn't actually um, do diaphragm fittings, but they had these pessaries that you could buy that were, um, could be used for other things or could be used for birth control and recipes how to make your own suppositories that were acidic and, and spermicidal. Um, they also believed in the efficacy of douching then, which is not recommended anymore as a birth control method. The idea is if, if you instantly douche right after sex with an acidic thing, I don't know, maybe there was some effect, but um, the barrier method was more the way to go. Um, so the, all the products that they displayed were, you could get at a chemist, you know, as they were called in the druggist or chemist, people made more of their own things then. They weren't all, you know, um, products. Um, but the information was not, and the information was illegal under the obscenity laws. It's specifically illegal to publish information that would prevent conception or induce abortion. And she also, she knew what she was doing was illegal, she, um, but she was building a case. So she collected stories from the women who came to her. So she has like volumes that she would publish in as motherhood in bondage of these poor women who just don't want to have so many children. So eventually she was arrested uh, and she and her sister served time uh, on what's now called Roosevelt Island, um, where she absolutely refused to be fingerprinted as uh, she felt that it was an indignity and not necessary because she was not a criminal, she was a political prisoner. So from this, she went on on appeal. She was, she was guilty of violating the law, but on appeal, she managed to widen the definition of disease for which a woman could be prescribed birth control. So doctors could prescribe it in certain cases and thus began a long career where she had court cases and in every state and, and tried to broaden the definition and challenge the, uh, the laws against birth control organizing birth control leagues everywhere, networks of clinics, which would eventually become Planned Parenthood. Um, and this is one of my images of her from the uh, current exhibit at the city reliquary, um, where she's holding her little uh, pamphlet, Family Limitation, and shining a light of uh, information up for women uh, to learn how to take care of their own bodies. So that's that slideshow. I'm gonna come back on big screen. Beautiful, thank you. I think it's so wonderful to see the images and hear the research and it's such a beautiful way of kind of getting deep into a person's personal story, the history learning at the same time, it's like it's activating all the different parts of a person. And I really love, especially that time travel that you're talking about, where you're there in Brownsville and you're looking at the current location. And then in your art, you're very effectively using color and those shapes to do the overlay of what was happening then, what's happening now. And then also that beautiful, gorgeous, sinuous, figure that you have in between. And I wanna ask um, if Rebecca has any questions or comments at this stage, cause you've been so kind to introduce us, but maybe you also have questions or comments for Sabrina. 
Um, thank you, Paula. And it's I'm really enjoying the the show, <laughs> the uh, seeing the artwork, and um, just uh, I agree about that piece. By the way, that's 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 gorgeous, and and it's all really beautiful, and and uh, uh, it brings back a lot for for me uh, because I've worked with these some of these same images and stories in my own work. So. It's just it's just a, a real treat to see the way that you are uh, such a brilliant storyteller and and uh, um, really make it so so relevant to what's going on today. I think that that's that's really you know the the biggest uh, s surprise about all this work is that we you know we've all in our own way been doing our feminist work for many years and you know trying to keep moving the needle forward. And now we're finding ourselves thrown back into uh, a very different time than we thought we were heading toward. So um, I'm, I'm very curious if you um, have any ideas about how, um, how art really works in the activism process. I mean, we all believe, obviously, that creating art and telling these stories is important. Um, but I, I wonder if there's any insights that you have, and, and Paula, you as well, in terms of how have you seen the process of speaking truth to power and to the people through activist uh, comics? How, how have you seen, have you seen seen evidence that that's really changing things? Have you seen evidence that that is effective and uh, a way to move forward um, with, uh, you know, with our efforts? Because of course it's easy to feel, you know, I'm doing this, but does anybody care? Is it making a difference at all? You know, so I'm curious what you think about that idea. I think that with children, I see the effects very intensely because I feel like the way of the ways of communicating they're in that period of time of rapid growth and being able to think and feel so many different things at the same time that are hard to express. And so I feel like art is a way to both hear what they're thinking and also communicate back what I'm thinking and then have a really strong back and forth. Because I feel like empowering children and women to me is, is the only way for us to keep moving forward. And I feel like where we're at is so bad but the forces that are trying to do that want to make it so much worse and so i feel like we are experiencing daily success by thriving and surviving to the degree that we even are and i feel like that might sound really dramatic <laughs> but it's i i feel true and i feel like the attacks that i've seen directly on children in my work, like I've witnessed and had to report sexual abuse of children, um, which is really disturbing. And that is so much more common in our world than we just want to deal with in the same way that the attacks on women are so much more common than we want to deal with even those of us who have experienced it, because just to get through the day, we're kind of um, you know, keeping a positive face. And I feel like art is able for me to balance out reality and keep that expression out there and also keep empowering people. So I feel like with children, I see the effects. And then also when people are seeing themselves reflected in the art. And so it's one of the reasons that I paint real people who are doing community work. And so people like Nando who frequently are in my art and 
um, June, my daughter and Raphael, who's frequently in my art, Sylvia, with all of these people, it also supports them and supports them in their work. At the same time that their work gets out there, I feel like it also brings attention to where they're the celebrities in, in my world and that I'm, I'm able to amplify the work that they're doing every day from the inside through this one channel and then encourage other people to amplify it in other ways. So we've had people come and work with us who are professional athletes or actors who then take that idea and tell these activist stories, maybe on television, maybe on in films. And I feel like I've stayed focused on this underground work because I really like it stylistically and I just, I, it appeals to me. And then I also really love helping the art build a bridge into mainstream publishing, mainstream films. And I feel like almost like a translator between this type of art and then the more mainstream forms. So I have seen the impact and I think it's why we're even alive right now is because of this type of soul healing and political changing art. I, let me just uh, say, Paula, that uh, seeing your work in that slideshow, and I've seen many of these pieces in the past, just really accentuated the kind of magical beauty of your work, which is imbued with love. And I think that that's one of the most powerful, moving, and effective things about what you do as an artist is that you know, so much of activist art is about fight, fight, yell, scream. And, you know, there's a time to fight and yell and scream. But what you're doing is you're showing what the reasons are that we're fighting and yelling and screaming. You're showing these vulnerable people who care and who are being empowered in the moment to have a voice. And you're showing that with this love and, and grace and this kind of glow that you put into your work. It's just, it, it's really moving. I find, you know, I find myself often moved almost to tears just at looking, by looking at your pictures, I have to say. And um, so there's an effect right there, just getting people's emotions engaged in a world where we get so split off mm -hmm. from our feelings because it's so, so, so much cruelty in it. And uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, I feel like having the right to be vulnerable and delicate and soft and sensitive in this world. Like that's the, one of the rights that I feel like I wanna keep is not to feel. And I like that in what uh, Sabrina, there was one of the panels that said about this sort of like aggressive guy way of expressing things, which is something that I also feel like is a really cool thing to learn. And it's like learning different languages is really cool. And then coming back, to that language, which is the one that feels really natural to me of that sort of delicacy and doing watercolors and doing soft ink lines and feeling like that's my right too. I don't wanna give that up. And I feel like there's a power to it that is this sort of delicate mitochondrial thread that goes back to our ancient Eve, you know? <laughs> I'm curious to hear what Sabrina thinks about the power of art. Well, I. I, I relate to what you're saying about softness, except for me, it's more about scale. You know, being able to do small drawings that have impact when, I, you know, um, being educated as a painter by abstract expressionist generations, it was sort of the idea that like serious artists had to do something bigger than the wall, you know, something you would have to get a bigger loft, you know, so you couldn't do it in your apartment. You know, that that was what serious artists did was like these huge things. And um, we're asserting the power of intimacy of something, you know, it's in a book and you look at it and you go, you go into it there. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to invest in like bigger real estate, you know, to have your work be taken seriously. I like that. That means I can have my work at home too. But I, I'm, I'm outing myself as a homebody now. Um, so I, I, a tip of the witch's hat 
to Paula, who I consider like a real activist artist, because you actually seem to be drawn as much or more to the organizing and the working with people. Whereas my part is like, I want it to be about these issues, but I also want to spend a lot of time at home drawing by myself. <laughs> but the really funny thing is that that's one of the reasons, like when I am given a choice of what do I want to do, I want to do tiny little ink and watercolor paintings on tiny pieces of paper at home in the quiet. And so when I'm working with kids, kids want to be outside, they want to be digging in the dirt, they want to be traveling, they want to be going to new places that they haven't gone before. And so it's been this amazing sort of stretching of both of my sides. And I feel like a lot of the activism that I'm doing, I'm following kids. That was how I got involved with Charis. That was how I got involved with sex education in schools. And the fact that like in New York State, New York State is like leading the country in terms of that um, New York State school employees are required to learn any name that a student is stating is their name and their pronouns and use them properly. And it's legally required of New York State employees in schools, which is so amazing. And that's like leading what's happening in the country. And I feel like I wouldn't be involved in these things if it wasn't through individual kids who are like, Paula, would you go to Albany with me? Because I'm going to lobby for abortion rights. And I'm like, I don't want to go to Albany. I want to sit right here on this comfy couch, this specific blue couch. I love this couch. I love being at home. And so I feel like it's this relationship with the kids. And it kind of, it ends up being these different parts of me. And I feel like it's important that sort of homebody part because I feel like that's something that I come to them with. And so I'm able to show them my drawings. Like I've shown them all of the drafts for the upcoming My Body Are Rights and gotten their feedback on it, all of the kids that I'm working with and that I have to offer to them because like you, I'm able to work on that small intimate scale in my home and so I can really show the things that are personal and true about me. So I feel like both are really important. Like, I don't want to give either one up. Good. That's a, an, an inspiration. I, I, have, I feel like I'm in a sort of uh, crisis mode uh, looking at the world around me because I've, for years I've told myself that what we do as artists, uh, putting our messages out there, and our heart and soul is um, informing the culture. And uh, we've won the culture wars where we do have, I mean, certainly most people in this country believe that any person should be able to choose to have an abortion for their own reasons. But because meanwhile, the Republicans have been, you know, gerrymandering and rearranging, you know, stacking the deck. So that they keep winning these minority with their minorities, uh, putting their minorities in power. So I'm I'm frustrated with that. I'm I no longer tell myself it's okay. I'm contributing to the conversation. I'm doing that because that's what I know how to do, you know. But I know more has to be done. I, unfortunately, it's it's not my skill set. But um, I hope that what we're doing still, you know, encourages and enlightens people to carry on. No, I really feel that it does. I mean, one of the things that the train's passing, sorry, when my daughter was very young and we spent a lot of time in the library because I just couldn't keep up with the number of books that she wanted to consume. And we found your Isadora Duncan book in the library and it just electrified her. And I feel like, especially that spread that you showed where it said no films were made of her. And then it showed Nuriev almost, was it Nuriev? Almost mm. like smelling her leg, you know? And I feel like that kind of like relationship to the body, to me, that's really radical. And that is reaching out through your book into the library, into my daughter, who then takes that in ways that are empowering for her. I think she was probably five, when was it published? 
2018 when Obama was elected. Hmm. 2018 or 20, 2008? I'm sorry, 2008, 2008, yeah. Because then that would make sense because she got it when she was five. Yeah. And I feel like I strongly feel that the work that you're doing, because you're connecting it to the research and you're connecting it to your personal history, that's why it connected to her on a personal level at the age of five. Because you can't bullshit a five-year-old. And it's like, I feel personally from that experience where we really came across it randomly in the library and I hadn't seen it yet. And then opening it and then just sort of following the lines, it was, there's magic in that. So I feel like the fact that we're being fucked with right now doesn't mean that we're not doing enough. It just means that some people are really fucking with us right now. And so I feel like we're doing the work and fuck them for like setting the terms of how we do our work. I feel like it's important that we have these conversations about what do we feel our work is. And I just want to say that the power of your work has affected my personal life and my personal child who's the most important person to me besides myself, you know? And so I, that is a gift. And I feel like that is something where it's so powerful that it's available in the public library. So the work that it takes for you to get it there, and that relates to one of my last questions is, I know you talked a little bit about your revisions process and your research process, but can you talk a little bit about getting your work to publication? You did about Paul Buell, that was really helpful. When he said no about Margaret Sanger, tell us what happened with yes. How did you get from the no to the yes? Yeah, I did a bunch of other projects because Paul Buell said, hey, I've got a publisher for it. And you always want to know that what you're working on is actually going to go out there. But then after a while, I was like, no, this is the book that I want to do. And I felt because of my first political art had been about reproductive rights, that this was my topic. God damn it, whatever complicated character she was. And she was. Um, and um, and, and uh, most of it laudable. <laughs> So um, basically, I drew two chapters, one about her story of Sadie Sachs, the woman that made her want to change the world. So that was the Margaret Sanger. And I realized that I was going to make this unique by framing it in my experience. Um, although the majority of the book would be about Sanger because it's about her and she's more historically impactful than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I then I did the chapter called Sex Ed in the 70s, where, so I, I, I had these two chapters, you know, like what her work means to me, having grown up going to Planned Parenthood, and how she became, who decided what her mission was in life. And um, uh, basically, Paul put me in touch with somebody who knew a lot of uh, agents, and uh, well, he tried to, show, he didn't really believe in it, I don't think, um, but he, he, his agent friend gave me a bunch of people to send it to who all said no. And finally, um, I asked a close friend of mine who was a writer who had an agent who only had one other cartoonist graphic novelist. And she liked the idea and she took it and, and she sold it to um, Counterpoint Press, actually Soft Skull. These, these publishers, they all eat each other up, as you know. They're like big fish, little fish. Um, Soft Skull that was started by our friend Sander Hicks and is now owned by another company. Um, so they I really like the message of persistence in that, that you just kept sending it out. Also that you had completed sections enough that people could see them. So I think anybody watching this, um, that's an important part of the story of the persistence, but also the fact that you had enough of uh, chapters, two chapters you said, right? Yeah. So that the flow could be understood. Um, how are we doing for time, Rebecca? 
Uh, thanks for asking. We've uh, we've gone over an hour now <laughs> officially, so uh, we should start thinking about wrapping up. Um, I did want to say that I do believe that books uh, save lives and change lives, and um, that uh, I I think you know we all have stories of the books that that saved us, you know, and that changed our lives. So yeah, I really liked your story about finding. Uh, Sabrina's book in the library with your daughter and discovering it that way because that's 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 a real event that happens every day you know people go to libraries and they find the information that they want and you know they find the things that are out there that they may not have been exposed to or might have been kept from them and uh, boy keeping books free and keeping you know access to information is we've fought so hard to to get this access and to be able to have the female body demystified from being evil and, and ugly and, and disgusting and horrible and obscene to being like be beautiful and sacred and living and, and autonomous and, and uh, you know, empowered. And uh, boy, we got to just, we got to stay on that hill here, you know, uh, but books are, are that, that hill is made of books, you know, <laughs> really, if you think about it. So uh, I didn't mean to suggest that that somehow you know the this process that we're engaged in is hopeless, but I know that sometimes it feels that way, and and this is one of these moments when we're all wondering, well, how could it have gotten this bad when we've been working so hard? You know, we don't have millions of dollars like some of these people, but we have we have our hands, we have our brains. <laughs> uh, so. Um, uh, I think maybe we should move on to what's coming up next, or, or, or is there more that you wanted to ask, Paula, real quick? Well, there is one thing that I wanted to say uh, to anybody who is watching this and would like more information on some of what Sabrina has been referring to about Sanger's controversies that Planned Parenthood has been doing a really great job recently of having um, extensive sections on their website and also written material available about Sanger's past statements, um, involvement in things that uh, are either racist or characterized in ways that are anti-Semitic, and that they are working to have an anti-racist um, development within Planned Parenthood that is really strong and really taking into account the positive contributions of Sanger, as well as the analysis of where she was incorrect, like where her science was good and where her science was poor. And then also really respecting the whole complex and ambiguous person. And so I wanted to say for people who are hearing what Sabrina is saying that there's a lot of good um, resources that you can find in Planned Parenthood. And thanks for addressing some of those ambiguities in your art and in your description, Sabrina. I really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, they have a good document called uh, Opposition Claims about Margaret Sanger. That is wonderful. That really goes right through it. The so sad. then for the next step, um, Sabrina, if you would be open to showing us your last slideshow and talking to us a little bit about what's next. Okay, so I have here uh, on my screen, coming to you soon, um, some highlights from uh, feminist issues of World War III, the last one, Shameless Feminists, and the one that's going to come out in 2023, which is called My Body, Our Rights, which the three of us are editing. But these are some of uh, some pieces from uh, the issue that we collaborated on before the pandemic. I wrote the story that I told you about before about my sexual assault at age 13. Um, the first step was drawing it as a little zine because I was really encouraged by going to the feminist zine fest and seeing women deal with really intense issues in this very intimate, even smaller than a comic book, the little handheld you know, uh, zine was like, that enabled me to write a personal story in this zine format. 
before I even spread it out and put multiple panels on a page. Um, so it talked about my concept of my body as a 13 year old tomboy, how unexpected it was that somebody would be interested in assaulting me, that I would be a sex object when I thought that was for my more buxom friend. Um, how I just at first allowed myself to be grabbed and led before I figured out a way to get out of there, saw an opportunity and escaped. And then half the strip is about the after effect that what it left me feeling like um, initially, like a piece of bait on a hook. Um, and later I responded in various ways over the years, like half the story is, is afterwards, you know, promiscuity, protest, <laughs> yoga, healing, getting middle-aged and having a totally different view of your body. But I like to do these celebratory scenes of uh, protest because that's always how I saw them. It's very affirming. Uh, another strip in that same issue is by my hero Fly, one of our great World War III artists, um, a story of a young girl learning to take care of herself after the boyfriend disappears. And Sue Siminski Bidala, a nurse reporting on how women in hospitals uh, working as nurses resisted the prison guards who brought in a shackled pregnant prisoner and refused to bow to him and just insisted that the woman be unshackled despite what their, uh, you know, their orders were. And a beautiful strip by Sung Young McFarlane, uh, virtually wordless about being an abusive uh, relationship. The first strip that we've done so far uh, by Emily Waters, about bicycling starts with a story she hears in the media about Pakistani women and girls starting a bicycling club and how they're mocked and assaulted and chased from the streets uh, because bicycling goes against traditional women's behavior as it did in, in Europe and America when it was first invented in the 19th century. Um, it was a very liberating thing for women then and, uh, and then she, she combines her own experience as many of us uh, remember when we were young girls and we got our bicycles and suddenly we could go further, safer, faster. And this is the cover for the upcoming issue of World War III, My Body at Rights. We had this on the books before um, we heard that Roe v. Wade was definitely going to be history, but we kind of saw it coming down the pike if you were paying attention. Um, we were joined by a whole bunch of artists who were active before Roe v. Wade, who were active, sexually active, as well as artistically active. Uh, this is by Lee Mars, one of our great underground cartoonists from the 70s, um, talking about what people did to get abortions then and now as people are driving to places where they can get them. Um, and we also have a story, um, it's a collaboration between Seth to Bachman, Tamara Wyndham and, uh, oh, Lana Clark Phelan. It's her experience and activist Jenny Brown helped edit it, but uh, Phelan described a, a pre-row abortion and um, sometimes they turned out well. Just because they were illegal didn't mean that they were always dangerous. Um, the experience of one of our mother-daughter teams, beside Paula and her daughter June, we have uh, Nicole and Elaine Schulman collaborated on this strip where Elaine told the story of uh, pre-row um, helping one of her friends and colleagues get an abortion. A retired doctor out of his home, it seems. And then another of our great uh, pre-row artists, um, Roberta Gregory of Seattle, uh, author of Bitchy Bitch, has her, her Bitchy Bitch character uh, suddenly impregnated again after all these years by this horrible um, changer of laws. 
And I tell the story in this one of the abortion I had during the safe years after it was legal, it was affordable for me. Um, there weren't even any protesters outside yet in the early eighties, but still it was complicated. So this is to acknowledge how even under the best of circumstances, um, you can be in a complicated situation in your life where choices feel difficult and you can know that you ought to have an abortion even though it, the pregnancy can be very appealing. And it can be ridiculous because you slept with so many men. So um, who knows who you should even be talking to about it. We have a new piece by Sue Ko representing how it feels to be a woman walking into a clinic now, even in the legal states where you have to go through a phalanx of uh, protesters. And Paula's piece, of course, uh, of how different people of different ages and ethnicities and everything come together in this to make this beautiful banner. And our co-editor, Rebecca, has been making an entire portfolio of goddess figures to explore aspects of the feminine divine and, uh, and how this type of imagery um, is a response to misogyny. And a gentle reminder from our beloved non-binary artist, Lauren Simpkin Burke, that this is not always necessarily framed as a women's issue because not everyone with a uterus is a woman and not every woman has a uterus. Uh, which brings us to the back cover. So over and out, that'll be um, another, of my, another of my celebratory uh, protest scenes, uh, letting you know basically what's inside the covers of the next World War III coming out next spring. Thank you so much, Sabrina. And thanks for also giving that uh, breadth of information. And we wanna really acknowledge that abortion is a different experience and can be really, um, even more painful when it's not trans affirming or when people who are black or BIPOC are experiencing the disenfranchisement from the healthcare system. And thanks for giving us that sort of breadth of information around the personal stories and also looking at how a lot of the people who were artists and working on this before Roe v. Wade, and now so that we have this sort of long scope to look at. And I'm gonna come back to Rebecca. Do you wanna to talk to us at all about that piece, that, that beautiful piece that Sabrina showed? Um, no, I think it's it's a lot to get into right, right now. Um, but, um, and it's, it's almost an hour and a half that we've been going, so. Uh, I think we should just wrap it up. But before we rapidly wrap, I want to wrap a bit about the uh, uh, World War III Illustrated event that's happening this uh, week. Uh, this this is going to be posted on uh, Monday. Is that right? Uh, Monday, uh, October twenty fourth, um, and uh, at the end of that same week. Uh, World War III Illustrated artists are going to be on a panel in Easton. Uh, so this is the this is the thing. I'm I'm backwards here, so I'm getting all confused. You can pick up one of the, these, or you can go to EastonBookFestival.com, where the there's the whole schedule is there and available. And so if you're watching this right now, uh, we would love for you to comment. Uh, tell us what you think um, and uh, be polite <laughs> and uh, and we we'll, we might answer because we we are human beings out here in the world uh, who are want to engage with you and um, and if you have any questions especially uh, feel free to ask and we will we will get to you uh, um, as soon as we can um, and so now that said unless you guys have any other things you want to add um, I will resume thanking our sponsors with 
with enormous gratitude uh, for uh, making this program possible. And I want to, first of all, though, thank uh, you, Sabrina and Paula, for coming and uh, uh, having this conversation with us about feminist art and the abortion issue in particular, which is so important right now. And um, uh, this, this has been a, a, a really a great pleasure and I've learned a lot about you guys that I didn't know. And <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that was fun and, uh, and just so wonderful to see your beautiful work and to learn about your process, uh, uh, Sabrina, and also your activism, uh, Paula, and uh, the impact that you're having with, uh, with your own educational and artistic work. It's just so inspiring. Um, so uh, thank you for, for coming, thank you for sharing, and um, we'll see you back at the editorial meeting. <laughs> yeah, Very thank soon, you, I'm sure. And thanks everybody behind the Easton Book Festival. So yes, uh, yeah, especially- wanna, wanna Thank everybody as well. Uh, and I, we especially wanna thank our presenting sponsor, Lafayette College, um, Book and Puppet Company, uh, Erco Community Federal Credit Union, uh, Fidelity Bank, Kelly Nissan, Lehigh Valley Voice, PA Bacon Fest and GEDP, uh, Pre-K for PA, WDIY 88.1, and WGPA Sunny 1100 uh, for, uh, for your wonderful uh, and absolutely vital support of books and free speech and uh, giving a voice to uh, those whose voices are seldom heard, which is the whole point of World War III Illustrated. Just want to pop these back up here again, these amazing books uh, with uh, uh, Paula and Sabrina's art on them. And uh, you can you can get your own if you come to the event. So hope to see you there. Thank you so much, everyone.